Game streaming is clearly a growing trend. You would be hard pressed to find someone who does not acknowledge that streaming services and subscription models are likely a huge part of the industry's future. But just because they are the future or the desirable method of distributing games for larger publishers and interested corporate parties, like Google for instance, does not mean that they are of universal benefit to gamers or developers. There is a rapidly growing number of streaming services, much like their video streaming counterparts, where once there was Netflix, then there was Hulu, and now there is a different subscription for almost every single major network or company. Video game streaming started with just a few, and is now ballooning out to include Microsoft Game Pass, Google Stadia, PlayStation Now, the upcoming Project X Cloud, and many more. I've discussed in the past how these services are not necessarily optimal for the end user. The focus on digital downloads, heavy DRM or digital rights management policies, plus the high connection speed priority and a lack of relative game stability paired with increased latency renders them an interesting service to say the very least, but far from ideal. However, today I want to focus on the indie games market and discuss why I believe the service, if widely adopted, will be a horrible thing for indie developers. The closest comparison is obviously video streaming and sites like Netflix. It's an imperfect comparison to be sure, but it's the best that we have and largely indicative of the licensing agreements that will likely be negotiated in the game streaming space as well. The differences between game streaming and video streaming are vast. One is a single mode of media, the other is a complex interaction between user and product, but even with those differences, one factor seems heavily prioritized on both sides, and that factor is user engagement and longevity. We already see this clearly manifested within the games industry in the form of games as a service, where once video game makers prioritized artistry and craftsmanship with regards to a fully packaged contained experience, now there is an increased focus on live service games that will span thousands of hours while keeping players engaged in a loop of activities. The reason for this is quite simple. A longer user engagement period means more opportunities to sell them things, and this desire for maximum engagement length is also reflected in the video streaming industry as well. It's not clear what exact factors Netflix considers or what level of priority they assign to that material, but when negotiating a licensing contract, user data is extracted in an effort to determine what content viewers are paying to see. According to Netflix officials, data is compiled to find the expected hours of viewing each TV show or movie generates over the course of an agreement, establishing a cost per hour viewed. That's the key term here. There are obviously discrepancies when compared to other streaming service licensing contracts. Not all of them will factor in the same data points or value those data points equally, but as a generalization, streaming services in the video entertainment industry heavily prioritize a cost per hour methodology, which rewards large shows or movies that hook viewers in for an extended period of time, but an independent film that only lasts, let's say, 15 minutes, while having been painstakingly crafted with a smaller team and budget than something like Avengers or another popular movie, is going to be awarded a disproportionate proportionately small contract, even if they are able to gain a lot of interest and fans greatly enjoy the 15 minutes of content that does exist. For the video game industry, we can see something similar. As reported by Eurogamer regarding a panel discussion at Game Lab, Paradox Interactive CEO Fred Wester said the following, Spotify, they pay you depending on how many times your song has been played. On Netflix, they pay you a fixed fee depending on what they think your product is worth. Those are two fundamentally different things, and that's what you see here as well. On Live, for example, they said you can have your game on our service and we're going to attract a lot of customers and we're going to deliver you money based on how many hours people play the game. Now, at Paradox, we loved that business model because people play our games for three or 4,000 hours. While the Game Pass model to us is still a decent model, we think we're not getting paid enough because people play our games more than they play very single-player driven narratives. This shows that while there is a spread of possibilities, some awarding different payout metrics, there is still a notable affinity for cost per hour contract modeling that is not beneficial to many indie titles. Think of it this way. There are a great many wonderful independent video games on the market that only span a couple of hours. Some are far longer, sure, but there is certainly a demand for artistically crafted stories, even if they are not able to engage a user for thousands of hours. Within a leaked Sony Netflix licensing agreement made available in 2014 via WikiLeaks, all of this information is clearly displayed. It's incredibly dense and unbelievably long, as most complex legal agreements are, but for anyone interested, it is a look at the exact specifics of how Netflix licenses large pieces of media in partnership with major companies. When considering a growing transition towards subscription-based models, artistically crafted games will be given less of a priority on a number of these services, and they can still seek out the ones that value their work at a higher rate, a product of economic competition, but even when doing so, they will receive a far less meaningful chunk of per-player profit than if they had independently sold their game direct to customers. 
This begs the question, why not remain independent and ignore the streaming services altogether? What would stop them? Truthfully, right now, that's entirely possible to do, but if we project forward the growing trend of subscription-based models over time, just as we see in the film industry, it becomes clear that if streaming does persist and become a mainstream addition to the space, it will rapidly overtake traditional distribution methods, and a side effect of that increased market share will be a fragmentation of audiences. Here is where I diverge into a somewhat speculatory tangent, but speaking from personal experience, and everyone else I have discussed this with for that matter entirely, it is largely unappealing to manage a dozen different streaming services to watch a dozen different TV shows, all tied down by exclusive contracts or whatever else. I don't want to have Netflix and Hulu and HBO and Sling and Amazon Video plus whatever else there is just to watch my shows. I want one, maybe two, and that's it. Not only that, but each of these services has a cost associated. So when faced with the option of paying $100 a month to have all bases covered and be able to watch most anything, and $15 a month while just watching whatever comes to this one specific platform that I like the best, well, let's just say a lot of platforms are not getting my subscription. Apply this same level of customer fatigue to the games industry and you will have a dozen different streaming platforms offering their games to a dedicated audience where each audience is smaller than the previous reach of traditional buy-to-play game storefronts. And the indie titles seeking to form a relationship with them will also be restricted based on the severity of any cost-per-hour viewed contract types. This is not an ideal scenario. It would be largely unfelt by major AAA titles since those major releases will see an audience migration just to play that one game. But for indie games, built upon artistic craftsmanship in a short lifespan, it will mean a smaller audience reach, likely locked down by an exclusive contract, less money if it revolves around a cost per hour licensing agreement, and a decrease in their ability to sustain themselves based on the dedicated patronage of a supportive audience. Think of an example like Game of Thrones. Yes, the final season sucked, I get that, but how many people bought HBO just to watch that final season? Game of Thrones had long episodes, though less than the number that was ideal to tell the entirety of the story, but that's beside the point moving on. The show had high user engagement, a massive audience, and an influx of subscriptions just to watch the material, meaning it would have been a very valuable contract had it been an independent production, but indie video games do not have the budget or the resources of a production that broad, and thus have decreased leverage. The video game industry already has a well-established trend of pushing from a top-down AAA perspective towards a live service model. Despite the avarice associated with it and the vocal minority pushback coming from dedicated gaming fans, the trend is still advancing, though not at a breakneck pace. And a further incentive towards this model in the form of cost per hour licensing from streaming services would not necessarily be a hugely beneficial thing for gamers, and it certainly would not be an enormous benefit to indie developers. The point of exclusivity, despite secondary ramifications and the function of decreased potential audience reach overall, can be beneficial for indie developers because it gives them an element of leverage to cash in on during the short term. An exclusive contract padded by a lucrative bonus for that contract can make the difference between one platform or another. But even this one element of increased negotiation power for the developers leads to a detrimental split in game availability and convenience for the desired audience, which can lead to vocal backlash. It's basically useless to fight technological progress. I'm not sure whether or not streaming services will rapidly dominate the games industry, much like they have the films industry, but the possibility exists. On a surface level, it may seem like a convenient and positive step, the same way that initial days of video streaming in the form of Netflix or whatever else were an eye-opening experience in consumer value. But upon deeper examination, the beneficiaries of this new technology would be the already bloated AAA publishers, with the very same products that many gamers decry as anti-consumer lazy or underpolished. The technology isn't quite there yet from a technical perspective, though it is certainly going to be appealing to a specific audience, but even when that technology does evolve to a point of overcoming issues such as connection speed or latency or whatever else, it will still have to grapple with the unavoidable issue of how best to create a content moderation and licensing policy that benefits both their consumers and partners in a meaningful way. As it stands, you can support your favorite indie developers. They might not get all the money, but you can support them in a very pointedly direct way. With a rise in streaming services, indie projects might get a more front-loaded contract with the bonus of exclusivity involved, but that direct method of support will be disconnected as players are subscribed through a central hub, and each individual contract negotiated is based on a variety of data mined factors, which could very well be to the detriment of some incredibly artistic but uniquely constructed indie games. 
Game streaming appears to be a looming prospect of the future, but it is far more complicated than a simple evolution of gaming as we know it purely to the benefit of the industry. It is a reformatted approach to distribution that bears a striking similarity to the TV and film industry, but that may not in fact be a good thing. In the end, it's best to understand what streaming is, and if it truly provides value to you individually as a customer, by all means, engage in those services. But be aware of what it is and how it may affect the space rather than rejoicing at what appears to be technical innovation, but might actually be detrimental. That's it for today, though. If you want to support the channel, check out the links down below. We have merch, memberships, stuff like that, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching, and have a nice night.